Welcome to Two Giant Goofballs, a New York Giants podcast. Are you a goofball that loves Giants football? If so, sit back and relax. Except you, that person driving. Sit up and keep your eyes on the road. Your ears, though, can still listen as we talk about the team that both excites and frustrates us so much. And now, and now here are your goofball hosts. Drew and Rob. Welcome, fellow goofballs, to Giant Goofballs, a New York Giants podcast. I am Drew, joined as always by... I'm me, I'm Rob. Let's talk about some tacos. I mean, some tackles. Oh, yes. It is time to tackle the issue of naming the best tackles in New York Giants football history here today, folks. And this is going to be a fun one. We got some interesting stories in this, even beyond the scope of football with some of these guys here. So this is one we've been looking forward to doing for a little while here. So let's break right into the tackles here. The first one we have up on the board. And actually, before we get started, I should even remind anybody who may not have seen the the, uh, the guard episode we did or the center episode right. we did. We're not ranking them necessarily based on this is the best. Though I think number one is obviously the best. There's no doubt about it whatsoever. But we're ranking them based on their accolades they received, if that makes sense. Because in the end, it's impossible for us to know how good a tackle was who played in 1927. Compared to 2023 yeah, or 2022. There's a big difference of games played, how the game was played. Yeah. And just the style of the position and how it's changed through the generations. Yeah. Plus, exactly. like a lot of these guys, a hundred years ago, there were tackle guards, they were running backs and punters all at the same time. Yeah. It was ridiculous. Kicking the extra point and going back to the the the, the uh, special <laughs> For the team. return. It's like, <laughs> like uh, what? Playing linebacker. <laughs> it's, it's like yeah, it's insanity. So. So, like I said, we're just going to give you guys, based on basically the accolades they received, to let you guys decide for yourself which ones you think are the best in that regard there. But the accolades are a good measurement, I think, of where they probably should be ranked. And I think this list is going to be pretty close to giving you it without us specifically saying it's a ranking. Because some of them, you could say, okay, well, this was a really good year for tackles. This guy's actually a little better, blah, blah, blah. There, you got yeah. that argument there. So, all right. First up, we have Bill Morgan, six foot two, two hundred and thirty-two pounds. And yes, folks, two hundred thirty-two pounds. He played. He was a big boy for ninety years ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Played with the New York Giants, nineteen thirty-three to nineteen thirty-six. Was a All-Pro first team in two, in that was a two thousand in nineteen thirty-five. Folks, you're yeah. talking like yeah. This is pre World War II. That's how far back we're going, guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, we got out of the Great Depression, so good for him. We did. Got out of the Roaring Twenties, and <laughs> yeah, uh, Roaring Twenties. But all the kids got see this way. I play football. So yeah, I support some kids. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Next up, we have another old timer here, Jack Hayden, six foot four. 233 pounds, and isn't it amazing that these guys were playing tackle back in the 30s? Like I mean, you also got to think about like nowadays. You also have to think about it too, like once again, like we just said, times are different. Nine years ago, like years got out of the Great Depression, where the average size of a uh, a man was what 140 pounds, where now they're 185, 190 pounds. They couldn't so, afford to eat. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's what it boils down to. But so you're talking about a guy that's 235 yeah. compared to a guy that's you know, 140, 145, that's a 90 pound difference. But that's also over double his body mass. Like, I walk around 220, 225. So when you see a linebacker that's 350, that's almost the same difference. I or a tackle, I should say. 265, all belly. <laughs> <laughs> Buddha. God of a, a body of a god. Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. Anyway, Jack played from 1936 to 1938 was a one-time NFL champ and a pro bowler in 1938. And to refresh everyone's memories that haven't been watching or have not been fallen, NFL championship was the Super Bowl back in the day before the Super Bowl era. Oh, yes. 
This was the pre Super Bowl championship year. Next up, Ox Perry. Which, first off, I'm sorry. Anybody else? That's a great Ox name. Perry, like as as an offensive tackle. Seriously, you're an Ox. Oh, we going back hey. to Coach Ski here. I was about to say, did you read this? So, did I read that story? What? What's is there a specific Coach Ski story we have to give out here? No, see, he didn't call everyone an ox. He called everyone a moose. Yes. No, he used to say you're an ox moose. Yeah, yeah. He said that to me in the middle of like a PR oh, one time. We got I drop. Hold on, we got to give a little like segue into this if you're going to tell a story here because you realize that I know who you're talking about, but most people have no clue who you're talking about whatsoever. This is true. So there was a guy. For those who aren't aware, Rob and I both went to the same high school. Uh, grew up in the same town and all. There was a coach that was uh, one of the assistant football coaches. It was a gym coach, um, a gym teacher, he, sorry. Um, his name was Coach Skininski, I think was his full name. Yeah. Uh, maybe coach. we shouldn't drop his whole name there. <laughs> listen, and we're not saying anything bad about him. I had no problem. No, but listen, like, he was always very nice to me. So I enjoyed him a lot because not only was he an uh, assistant football coach, yeah. he was also um, – when I started wrestling, he was a freshman coach for the wrestlers and then became... Yes, he was, yeah. yeah. That's right. He was a wrestler. And then, and then he came into like an assistant coach for wrestling. Yeah. So, but no matter what you did, he called everyone a moose. Yes. You're he's an ox moose. moose. You're an ox moose, everybody. <laughs> but when you're sitting, like when you're, you know, 16 years old or 15, whatever it was at the time, and I have 195 pounds over my chest... When I'm weighing 180 pounds, and he just looks at me and goes, You're an ox, moose. <laughs> it just completely stopped everything in my tracks, and I went, <laughs> uh, so, so, anyway, Ox Perry, six foot four, 230 pounds. Played with the Giants 1937 to 1939. Also a one-time NFL champ and a pro bowler in 1938. And for those, again, who haven't been paying attention to the prior episodes we've done on the guards and the centers, basically, if you played offensive line in 1938 for the New York Giants, you probably yeah, went to great. the Pro Bowl, even as a backup. I don't know how that's possible. But like we had like yeah. three centers and four guards. <laughs> Now we got, now we got. You know what is this? Now this is two tackles already out of the first three from 1938. So it was just one of those things that if you played tackle, or I mean, you played offensive line 1938 for the New York Giants, you probably made the Pro Bowl. Back then, there's what six yeah. teams anyway. I mean, it's, it's that's not say. Then there's little, teams. There's like sixteen teams. It was a little less meaningful to make the Pro Bowl. It's like, oh, you beat the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's step into more modern times here. Oh, yes, it's the late 70s disco era. Oh, yes. The stew. Yeah, disco stew. <laughs> We're going into the 80s here as well. Yes, don't you forget about me. <laughs> With Brad Benson, six foot three, 262 pounds. Played with the New York Giants. Wait, what was that? I say he's a giant compared to the last few guys. Oh yeah, he's got, he's got thirty pounds on him. Uh, played with the New York Giants from nineteen seventy eight to nineteen eighty seven. One time Super Bowl champ, Pro Bowler in nineteen eighty six. Now, those of y'all that live in the New Jersey area and listen to radio, remember growing up, it was on New Jersey one hundred one point five like crazy, especially for some reason. Brad Benson Auto Group may ring a bell. This is that that Brad Benson. So. Um, he literally had the largest volume Hyundai dealership in the entire country. Sold it a few years ago to DCN Auto, so you're not going to see it anymore. Did have some controversies for some of the stuff he said while in the automotive industry. A few uh, things that might get people canceled nowadays, I guess, for the lack of a better term. <laughs> but you know, he it was it was simpler times. And <laughs> um, last we heard, actually, a lot of the ex Giants were trying to raise money for him. He's apparently had some major medical issues going on there. Um, I did not hear that. Yeah, so, yeah, I know uh, Harry Carson was talking about it. I think, if I'm correctly, I think uh, Phil Sims and Carl Banks also were involved as well. So, you know, I definitely hope the best for the guy because, you know, you never want to see somebody going through bad times. So, you know, 
thoughts and prayers for him and his family. And hopefully things are getting better. Cause I haven't heard an update in like a year or two, as far as how he's doing, but you know, it would explain why he's still the dealership obviously too. But if they're raising money yeah. for him, that's whatever he's got going on, obviously is very expensive treatments and that kind of stuff, which unfortunately yeah, can happen in this area here. And I'll get off my soapbox and medical card. Just... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Brad Benson, like I said, first of our modern, more modern ish tackles here. And then we go right into his replacement. Talk about a guy in Ox Perry having the coolest name ever for an offensive tackle. Guess what? This guy might tie him for that. Mr. Jumbo Elliott. Jumbo Elliott. I mean, you, how, you, yeah, you don't get a better nick, you get a better name for a uh, a tackle than Jumbo. And Guy played, and he was a second-round pick in 1988. So literally, like what I said, Brad Benson played to 87. Here he goes, right in 80, 88 at that point there. So he literally just took over the role for him. And for those who are wondering, Jumbo is, of course, not his real name. No, Nobody names their child Jumbo. Can you imagine, like, BB gets born, like, whoa, what's the yeah. name of Jumbo? <laughs> well, he came out, like, 10-7. So, yeah, yeah Jumbo has got to be. So... <laughs> He his actual name is John Stewart, not to be confused with the guy from the Daily Show, John Stewart Elliott. <laughs> so he is uh, six foot seven, three hundred eight pounds. Though. I mean, yeah, that's a massive, massive. So man. it's uh, it's not just a creative name. No, no. I mean, that's <laughs> very descriptive. Yeah, it's. I mean, he's basically my height with another another forty pounds on him. Of yeah, actual no offense, I have no I was about to say, no offense, it's a probably a different type of yeah, 40 yeah. pounds. 40 pounds of muscle. I definitely have no muscle whatsoever. So, um, played with the Giants from 88 to 95, then went on to play for the Jets, um, for Coach Parcells there for the Jets in 1996 to 2002. <laughs> First off, I still say that's the most ridiculous musical ever. And that says the lock. There's a freaking goddamn ridiculous musical, West Side Story. Because, I'm sorry, if you're in a gang and you're pirouetting around the streets of New York, someone's going to shank you. You're not making it out. Yeah, no, you're not singing about the fight. Like, oh, look, they they brought a pirouette. I brought a gun. Psh, gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought his pirouetting would have not, would not, been, not won this, this gang war? <laughs> Uh, anyway, of course, Jumbo was a one-time Super Bowl champ uh, in the 1990 season there. was a Pro Bowler also in 1993. So he gets the list because that one Pro Bowl there. Um, and, and Super yeah, Bowl. That's help. I mean, the two of them are kind of interchangeable, though, as far as Brad Benson and, and Jumbo Elliott. I give it to Jumbo because I think he was a little bit better of a player. That's why I, you know, I ranked him higher on this. But it's like at the same point. They're kind of interchangeable as far as that, but Jumbo had the uh, the longer career overall. I think that's what gives him a little bit of the, the stretch there. Obviously, you're talking about ten years for for Brad Benson, and you're talking what fourteen years, fifteen years for for Jumbo. So that's a pretty damn yeah. good long career. So especially yeah yeah especially at that time of that position. All righty, so. Next up, we're continuing our theme for the coolest names for football players possible. Tex Love Coulter. It. Tex Coulter. Like, hello, Tex. I'm just glad he's not a cowboy with that name because that'd be worse. But sounds like a sandwich name. Yeah. <laughs> Go on in there, Tex, and block that. What do you want your man? <laughs> what do you want that to be, Tex Coulter? <laughs> uh, it's like it's like he's made for a cowboy western movie. It's it's there. Good old spaghetti western. <laughs> and now, you feel lucky punk, you're about now, to get tackled. And now we present "I Love My Horse," starring John <laughs> Wayne and Tex Coulter. <laughs> uh, six He's foot four, six foot four, two hundred and fifty pounds. Uh, played with the New York Giants from nineteen forty six to nineteen fifty two. Pro Bowler in 1951 and 1952. So he entered his career with two Pro Bowl seasons. Uh, also, during his career, he played defensive end at center at times as well. So this is that old school, I'm going to play all around the place kind of thing. Um, but, you know, especially in those times, that's a pretty decent long career to have. You know, you didn't see the guys having 10, 15 years uh, of playing football back in those days, at least in the NFL. 
Uh, on top of that, the guy was born in 24. I'm trying to think. So, go yeah, okay. No, he was 22 when he got drafted. I'm trying to see if the war affected the year he started because that did happen for a lot of those guys back then. But no, that did not for good old Tex there. So, like I said, just you know, good career overall there, though. All righty. So, next up, I'm breaking a rule again. I know. Breaking, I saw it. I, I saw I'm it. Breaking it. You, you kind of have to. Kind of have to because let's be honest, folks. We've got some good tackles. We don't have a plethora of great tackles. You know, it wasn't like the running back group we talked about. We're like, okay, great player, great player, great player, great player. You know, it's not like, you know, the, the, the quarterback where you have some of the best quarterbacks in Eli Manning, Wyatt Tittle, Frank Tarkenton, Phil Sims, these guys. So we got to add onto this list. And he squeaked in because he got a, an award last year. Andrew Thomas. I mean, at the same time, though, like arguably last year, he was top three, top five tackle. You, I make the argument because he's second team all pro that he's the second best left tackle in the league. There you go. See, like, so, second team all pro last year, six foot five, 315 pounds, fourth overall pick in 2020. And I'm also going to make the argument that we listed him again, we listed based on the current accolades. I guarantee you if we do this list again in five years, he's way the hell up there. Most likely. Yes. In- injury, like hopefully nothing happens, you know, but yeah. Yeah, this is this is the guy that has all, he just gets better, better. all of the potential in the world here. So, you know, hopefully we expect to see great things out of him and hopefully a contract extension soon as well because yeah. that's that needs to get done. All righty. On to one of our more interesting stories here in this. And this guy is definitely the Giants version of the great Pat Tillman. Um, I will say this. Some childish people out there may chuckle a little bit when we say his name. Oh, so, I will. Don't worry. Um, his name is Al Blosies. <laughs> So, so, like I said, some people may chuckle a little bit, like Rob, apparently. <laughs> um, this is a guy who had a very short career, unfortunately. And if his career was ever able to meet its potential, if tragedy had not struck, this man could be so high up in this list, he'd probably be number two. He's that good. Six foot six, 250 pounds, drafted in the fifth round pick in 1942. Now, remember, we were just talking about guys that are playing a little bit before him that were 230 pounds. So, here now you go with a guy 250 pounds, playing with a guy like yeah. a guy in the 60s and 70s, that kind of that kind of size. Yeah, because you it's, like we were just talking about 1935, 125 pounds, 130 pounds is big. Yeah, this was a big. <laughs> Big man on top of the six foot six part. I mean, I'm six foot seven, but still, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you just didn't see that. In we get it. You're tall. All right. <laughs> That's what I got. Okay. That's what I got. <laughs> uh, only played with the New York Giants 1942 to 1944. Even 1944, he played just a couple of games because what broke out, of course? World War II. World War II. We're off. On the march to war. Um, before that happened, though, he was an all-pro in 43. He was a pro bowler in 42. Now, he wanted to go into the military. And here's something I never even thought about until I, I read the story on him. He wanted to go into the military. And he couldn't because he exceeded size limitations. I never even knew that was a thing. I didn't know either. That's... So apparently he was too big. So they were they were worried that he wouldn't fit into different vehicles and uniforms and I guess I say I that would be a hard to get a trailer. No, well, I'm I, sorry. I guess you're too big I mean, and scary. You can't go into war. Yeah, right. <laughs> you're too big of a target. Yes. I you mean, I would. I, I mean, strikes. You'll get struck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, they they would be able to make your yeah, you know, your your uniform, yeah, you know, tailored, I guess. But but that is a uh, that's a good point too, because like look at the old school jeeps that yeah. you would have been in a convoy. Oh right? yeah, it's lay across the back. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> we could um, put four guys back there, but we only put this one man. Yeah. So he literally pleaded and begged with the government to get a waiver because he wanted to go to war that much. He thought that was something he had to do as an American. So that in itself, right there, I mean, again, Pat, Pat Tillman-esque because the man didn't have to go to war. He had an easy out. He's leading a amazing start to an NFL career. Could have just kept that going and forced his way into war anyway. They gave him a desk job in the beginning. He still kept pestering and pestering and pestering until they sent him off to the front line. He would not give up until they did that. He died in 1945 in France during the war. One of two New York Giants to die in World War II. As a result of combination of great play for the few years he had, plus the obvious patriotism and heroism that man displayed, his number was retired, and he's in the Giants ring of honor as well. Well deserved, seriously. Yes, yeah, well deserved. This is a story like I have heard the name before. I never knew the full story. And I I think that's kind of a shame. And this is why I like doing these kind of episodes and, you know, giving everybody the, 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 the knowledge of the history of, of the New York Giants because these are stories that should not be forgotten, point blank. I mean, again, no. I know we're talking 80 years ago, guys, but you figure Pat Tillman was, what, 20 years ago? How would you feel in 60 years if nobody knew about Pat Tillman and what he did? Yeah, no, I mean, 100%, especially, like, back then, like, times were so different. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of people try to get to the war. I mean, there was oh, definitely yeah. people that would try to not go to the war, but there was definitely a lot of patriots. You know what he re- it reminded me of when I was reading the story of what happened with him was it reminded me of the beginning of Captain America, but, in, like, in reverse. Yeah. You're too big and healthy. You can't go to war. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was like that's what it kind of reminded me of like the reverse version of that but like i said the fact that this man kept just begging to go like took so many steps to get there and then literally dies when he gets there that's just it's sad it really is so you know you know if if anybody is still out there as far as the family so i didn't look to see if he even had children beforehand or whatever you know maybe some nieces or nephews or something like that you know definitely thank you for his services because that's that's legit right there, seriously. Yeah. That's like, I almost don't want to move on to the next guy because I'm like, I'm soaking this in even as we're telling it. And obviously, we, Rob and I yeah. know what's going to happen with this conversation with this man. But it's it's just an amazing story. And, you know, one that we might actually, it might actually be a good person to do an actual full episode on one day as well, even. Because we're giving you, obviously, the Cliff Notes version of this. But that's a hell, of a, still- and a hell of a story. And there's so much to his story that, yeah. like you said, we should probably do an episode down the road. Yeah. And, I mean, the man actually still has fields named after him. Like, that's that's how revered he is out in Minnesota right now, where he actually used to play. I believe he played college there, if I remember correctly. But I saw that when I was looking up a couple things on him, that there was a, a stadium. Um Here's a track and field stadium named after him as well. Uh, so, you know, like I said, it's he, he's a name that not everybody has forgotten. Don't get me wrong when I say it like we were talking about before. But it's a name that's not talked about enough, I think. You know, and I, and yeah. I think we definitely, need to, we definitely need to remember that story. And like I said, it, it may very well be an episode later on because it, it's that good a story to give the whole full details there. All righty. And... To, to get into the story of tragedies here, we're going to like, I didn't realize we did, when we wrote this out, we did back to back tragedies here. Mm. Glenn Grant, six foot three, 235 pounds, played with the New York Giants from 1930 to 1937. One time NFL champ and was an all pro in 1930, 1931. He died in 1938 because he was struck by lightning. Free, it's free thing. Yeah, it's crazy. That's like, yeah. And I didn't get it. I was trying to find the, the story on if he had retired or if he got struck by lightning. And that's why he stopped playing, obviously, because he passed. But 
I would I didn't be able I couldn't find that out if he like like because that's like that's like a Twilight Zone thing. Like all I do is work. All I do is work. Can't wait till I retire. Retires struck by life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, that's that's, that's, that's probably... a Twilight Zone thing. That's that's definitely like yeah. Uh, as, as Connor pops in, someone manscaped today. We don't say that name anymore, Connor. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for noticing. Yes, they they gotta they gotta pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't realize uh, the camera is that low. <laughs> oh, it is. <laughs> That's the extra camera feed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Next up is another old timer here. We got so many old timers here. So many old ta- old tackles in the Giants' history here. I mean, it's um, also it's also you know. Part for the course when you have an organization that's been around for close to 100 oh, years. Yeah. As Connor says, those bastards. Well, yes, they did kill Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> so next up, we have Ed Wyseth, who six foot, was six foot one, 223 pounds, fourth overall pick in um, 1937. Played with the New York Giants 1937 to 1940. So only a fourth, you know four or five year career there but, but like, that- like we said that was the time to be on the Giants O-line yeah so <clears throat> yeah this is what not the third tackle for 1938 um, yep. so one time NFL champ all pro in 1938 second team all pro in 37 39 um, and pro bowler in 1938 also Obviously, separate from the Giants, but he's a member of the College Ho- Football Hall of Fame as well. You know, but think about that for a minute. The guy played 37, 38, 39, 40, four years. Three of those four years, he was all pro first or second team. That's pretty damn impressive. Yeah. That is pretty damn impressive. So, as Connor says, had to use telescope on you, Roberto. Just kidding. Why would he have to see anyway? He's just kidding. Ooh, Connor, we didn't think he'd seriously have a telescope on Ra- uh, Roberto there. Say so you? Where are you at, Connor? He, he says, it, it, he said, oh, he clarifies that it's a microscope. Oh, oh. Are you in my room? <laughs> and, then, and then Dakota says, you guys could be playing Diablo 4 right now. What's <laughs> <laughs> up, <Stop>, Dakota? <laughs> I did. <laughs> All right. I just want to switch up. over. I got I got a druid mage barbarian going on. <laughs> Next up, we have John Mellis, six foot even, two hundred and fourteen pounds. Think about two hundred and fourteen pounds playing offensive tackle, ninth round pick, and guess what year? Nineteen thirty-eight. What do we say? Ooh. If you played nineteen thirty-eight. All pro. Probably went all pro. Um, so played from 1938 to 1941, then went to war and played elsewhere 1946 to 1949. So he had a decently long career, which is the only reason that uh, I think he goes ahead of Ed Wyseth is because of the fact that he just had a longer career. All pro in 1941, pro bowler in 1938. So this is Four tackles now in the Pro Bowl from the New York Giants in 1938. Um, and uh, was a <laughs> Pro Bowler also in 1941 as well. That's just kind of crazy. That's Think about that for a minute. That's, that's, that's a lot of uh, players from one specific, you know. Year. That. Yeah, <laughs> one year, one team. Um, that's Yeah, that's kind of crazy. Um Next up on the list. Now, this is as modern as it gets almost. The second most modern person on this list to Andrew Thomas, of course. And a guy who a lot of us probably remember very fondly from the Eli Manning years. David Deal, six foot five, 304 pounds. Finally, a 300 pounder. Yeah. <laughs> deal, no deal here. There's a deal. Deal or no deal. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pick suitcase number five. <laughs> um, fifth 305 round, pounds. 
fifth round pick in 2003. Played with the Giants from 2003 to 2013. Two time Super Bowl champ, second team All Pro in 2008, Pro Bowler in 2009, and basically played everywhere on the line during his years except for center. He played both guard positions, both tackle positions, but his best seasons were a left tackle. So that's why he makes the list as a tackle there. Because we, we we had discussions about where we put people that played multiple positions like a David Deal. But in the end, it's based on where you got your wins, your accolades, your awards from. And that's where David Deal got them. He got them at the tackle position. And, I mean, talk about a guy who, as basically as important as it gets to protecting Eli all those years in the Super Bowl runs. Because let's be honest, Eli wasn't always the easiest guy to block for. No. And what I mean by that is not a disrespect. What I mean by that is Eli didn't care if he got hit. He didn't, point blank. So he would just no. stay back there hoping something would open up. Yeah, he, he held the ball <laughs> in the pocket. Yeah. Which makes it very hard for that O-line yeah. to block for him. The At longer it takes for him to throw the ball. Much. Yeah, I was about to say, the longer it takes for him to throw the ball, it means the longer it takes for that line yeah. to hold up the block. Yeah, got to hold that pocket because he wasn't leaving it, that's for sure. He did not want Eli yeah. running the ball. <laughs> no. <laughs> what did he do, like a, a handful of times in his career? Yeah, he, he probably has probably similar rushing stats to Tom Brady. Well, probably right there, yeah. Yeah, yep, yep. All righty. Next up, we're going back in time again. Gonna Stepping go back, back in into- time. Stepping back into Mr. Peabody's Wayback Machine. <laughs> Frank Cope, six foot two, 225 pounds. Let's just let that soak in for a second. He's at 80 pounds less than David Deal. That's the amazing difference here. Now, how many tackles are we up to in 1938? <laughs> five. Four. Make that five. Because Frank Cope played with the Giants in 1938 to 1947. One time NFL champ. Part of the NFL's 1930s all-decade team. All-Pro in 1945. Pro Bowler in 1938 and 1940. But let's let that sink in as well for a minute. The guy was drafted in 1938. He's on the NFL 1930s all-decade team. He only played two seasons in the 30s. That's how good he was. That's how good he was. And he is, like I said, number five as far as Pro Bowl tackles. From 1938. You know what? That's another episode we could look at even doing eventually. Analyzing the 1938 New York Giants and how the hell that's, got that, like 10 offensive linemen in the Pro Bowl because that's insanity. Yeah, like uh, uh, how? Like, it just blows my mind. Yeah, I, I, I'm really interested to see the, the, the Pro Bowl roster and see how many um, non-Giants are actually <laughs> in the... Uh, you know, in in the Pro Bowl, because it's just it just seems insanity to me. Now, obviously, um, you know the Giants won the Super Bowl that year, so that just tells you right there that obviously they were, you know, a little bit good here. Let's see, I'm looking here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. 28 Pro Bowlers. Like, legitimately, half the roster was the New York Giants. Next, 38, 28, 38. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. See, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20 people were on the roster that didn't play for the Giants. There's more Giants than non Giants on the 1938 Pro Bowl. That's insanity. <laughs> you want to talk about league domination? That was a good year to be a Giants fan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's pretty damn impressive. And you know what that leads us into? That leads us into talking about the man who led the 1938 Giants, Steve Owen, who also was an offensive tackle. It's almost like having an offensive tackle coach helped them form a good line. Almost. Almost. So, 5'10", 237 
and pounds. Played with the Giants from from 1926 to 1931. Came back out of retirement in 1933 to play for a few games because of injuries to the team while he was the head coach. One-time NFL champ as a player. Part of the NFL's 1920s all-decade team. Was pro bowler in 1927. As far as the coaching aspects, we talked about that. I'll give that briefly. Head coach of the New York Giants from 1930 to 1953. Just 23 years. Two-time yes. NFL champ as a head coach and inducted into the Hall of Fame as a coach in 1966. Talk about a Imagine you lose a tackle and then you get like Kafka going out in the line or something. <laughs> like yeah, it's like that's crazy. Is that even yeah. like legal these days? Yeah, it's I mean, in all fairness, he only played for five, you know, five, six years. So he probably wasn't that old when he came out of retirement at that point to, to uh yeah, I hear you. But at the same you time, Kafka is still pretty young. Go ahead and do that. So he was born in 1898. So he would have been 35 when he came out of retirement. So, yes. Man, you got to lace him um, up, get the cleats on. Oh, yeah. You ready to go? As Connor says, free learned how to count to 30 from the best teacher ever. One, two, three. Ah, ah, ah. Count from Sesame Street. Oh, yes. The good old count. I love that. Okay. I'm going to, we, we'll do a little sidetrack as we always do. Um, if you look up, Jimmy Kimmel used to do a thing, and this was years ago, called unnecessary censorship, where he would censor things to make them sound perverted and gross and disgusting. And there was a part of that which the count singing the one, two, three song he does one, two, three, one, two, three. <laughs> But ah, ah, ah. <laughs> and it, I think if I remember correctly, the words was how I like to count. But he would change. He would bleep out the word counts. He'd be like how I like to bleep. <laughs> <laughs> ah, uh, ah, ah. Yeah, it's yeah, it's funny. Like I said, if you got a chance to YouTube that, there's no children around because it's really bad for children to listen to. <laughs> but it's hilarious. <laughs> uh, he also says, Dakota, instead of playing Diablo Four, give me a Diablo sandwich and a Dr Pepper and make it quick. I'm in a goddamn hurry. Buford T, Justice Smokey, and the Pentid. What is there a Diablo sandwich? Is that the name of the sandwich he wanted? I don't even know. I, I mean, it's I usually know. a spicy sandwich. I I don't know. I I do love that movie though. That is Burt Reynolds' best movie ever. Just saying. Mm. Yes, I got the theme song in my head now too. <laughs> All righty, we are on to number one. Undisputed, ah, ah, ah. undisputed number one. In fact, you could look at all the offensive linemen we've ever had, and this man might be number one. I mean, you got Mel Hines, the only guy I would say you might put ahead of him, but he might be number one, and that's Mr. Roosevelt Brown, Rosie Brown. Six foot three, 255 pounds, 27th round pick in 1953. Let that soak in. 27th round pick. So, yeah, you think he was drafted a little late? Yeah, just a little. Just imagine late. covering that live draft. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> we're like, we're done, folks. We can't do it. I'm tired. Um, played with the New York Giants from 1953 to 1965. That's a dang good long career as a, as a tackle there. Uh, Hall of Fame, class of 1975. He holds the record for the latest drafted player ever to be in the Hall of Fame. He was drafted with the 322nd pick in the NFL draft. Uh, That's also yeah. another amazing stat that he was drafted in the 27th round. He's 300 and what? Yeah, 322nd. And how many get drafted out of seven rounds now? Like, Well, 32, you think, because there's 32. But you also get the comp picks and that there's other things in there. But yeah, yeah. I mean, that just tells you there was like half the teams back then. Um, 1950s NFL All-Decade Team. The NFL 70th, 75th Anniversary All-Time Team. NFL 100th Anniversary All-Time Team. So yeah, you're talking about that wasn't that long ago. He still has that kind of respect. So 
you're talking that many years later. And that was 2019, guys. That was just four years ago. Uh, it makes me feel old to say four years ago was 2019. But yeah, four years ago, you're talking 35, let's see, 54 years after he played. He's still considered one of the best players to ever, ever put on a uniform. Not just the Giants, any uniform. Yeah, ever. One, one time NFL champ. Here's the stats of the accolades this man got. First team All Pro, 1956, 1957, 1958, 1959, 1961, 1962. Second team All Pro, 1960, 1963. So think about it. that's an eight year stretch that he was first or second team All Pro. We were happy with Andrew Thomas getting one. Yeah. Eight. That's pretty damn impressive. Pro Bowler, 1955, 1956, 1957, 1958, 1959, 1960, 1962, 1964, and 1965. Just had a few Pro Bowls. Just a couple there. Just a couple. Um, He had to retire because of a medical issue when he was just 33 years old. He was still, we talked about it, his last year was 1965. He was a pro bowler still in 1965. He probably could have played for two, three more years easily, but he had to retire. And after he retired, he was an assistant coach and a scout for the New York Giants. As a player, coach, or scout, he spent over 50 years with the New York Giants. That's a long pretty, time with the goddamn impressive. Yeah, that is like, yeah, you don't hear about that. Talk about the once a giant, always a giant. That's about as once a giant, always a giant as you get. I mean, he was the assistant offensive line coach, became an offensive line coach in 1969. And was a scout for many, many years. I mean, you can go to like the end of his life. And the man died in 2004, by the way. His end of his life there, just to get out the, the 80s and 90s and all that kind of stuff. And he was still working as a scout for New York Giants. We're talking the Parcells days. That kind of stuff. So, yeah. Also, good time to be a giant. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like, But he was there for that. That's how long he was a part of the New York Giants. So, you know, and when you're talking an eight-year stretch, when the average NFL player plays for three years, and for eight years, almost three times as long as the average NFL career, you are considered the best or second best at your position. Yeah. That's to him. Hands down. Impressive. Yes, he is definitely, like I said, the best tackle the New York Giants have ever had. And I'll say this, if Andrew Thomas passes him, I would be shocked. Because I know some people are like, oh, Andrew Thomas will be towards the top of the list. And I even said he'll move up in the list. He won't be. He's the number Brown. two. He won't be. Who does number two work for? <laughs> the New York Giants. He he will not beat out the career that this, the amazing Rosie Brown had. I mean, talking like I said, this is one of those guys that is just if you did a Giants Mount Rushmore, which must be kind of a cool episode. We might do that one time. Ooh. This would be the guy who you probably would put on there. He would be a Terry Roosevelt. Yeah, he would probably be a Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt <laughs> Brown. Um, right up there next to, uh, you know, George Manning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Lawrence Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but I mean, like I said, it's, he's, just, he's just that important to this franchise for everything he did. Um, like I said, that's sticking around that long, having a Hall of Fame career. And I got another guy that I feel like 
unfortunately, kind of time is making people forget about how good he was. Just amazing, absolutely freaking amazing player. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. sadly, just time passes by. Like you, gotta, oh, yeah. you gotta think about it. 2004. He passed away, but how many Giants fans are out there that didn't start watching football until 2005? Well, you also got to think about the fact that he stopped playing in 1965. So you're talking it's been almost 60 years since he played. Yeah. It's quite a while. It's quite a while. So, you know, most people listening or watching probably never saw him play live. I know I didn't. No. No. I'm not that old. I feel it sometimes, but I'm not that old. <laughs> Dude, I don't even think my father even watched this man live. Yeah. Um... He probably did. He may have. He would have been five. Yeah, see? That's that's I'm, retired. I'm not saying he, he watched it thoroughly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my father may have. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, like I said, it's definitely one of the best Giants to ever put on a uniform there. All righty, guys. So, Wednesday. Wednesday, I think we have a really fun one lined up for you guys. Mm. Oh, yes. The best Giants head coaches of all time. I that's we're doing the battle of coaches here because this is one I think you're going to get some people arguing over. I really do. Um, the Drew I, wants but Ben Matthew at number one. I'm absolutely not. He's got to be A+. Plus. What happened? So you want to put Ben McAdoo at number one. Um, I said absolutely I was, not. I, I was thinking Ray Hanley personally, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pat Shermer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, guys, we're gonna we got a go? lot of really good coaches um uh, that coach the New York Giants there. We're also gonna do Thursday for you. We have an episode ready to go for you guys on the greatest um assistants that went on to be head coaches in the league. There's a mm-hmm. lot of guys that are famous coaches that were coaches before they became head coaches. For the New York football giants. And I, I think it's fitting to give kind of a kudos in that because the Giants have so many, so many historic moments as a franchise. And I don't think it's he'll really look at it all. All these different historic things, you know, the the defense chant, the spiking of the football, the um, you know, the the Gatorade tossing to the coach at that point, the going to Disneyland after a Super Bowl. Like there's so many things the New York Giants did first. So you gotta go over all this stuff here. So like I said, we'll be back if you guys Wednesday doing the head coaches. We'll be back on Thursday talking about assistants who became head coaches in the league elsewhere. I did it specifically as elsewhere because if we start talking about guys who were assistants with the coach with the Giants and then became coaches with the Giants. You'll basically be listing every single head coach to ever coach for the Giants. I was gonna say. Giants <laughs> love to hire with in-house. Like I don't think people realize um, how many people were coaches or players within the Giants organizations and then became a head coach. It was it's very much a theme that the Giants have had for most of and I think that's why that's why when you with the the, the hiring of Dable and Shane was such a big deal because they went totally outside the organization. Yeah, and they just don't do that typically. But I will say this: when people say they went totally outside the organization, it's half true as well because Parcells actually worked with Joe Shane. There is that connection; they worked together in Miami. So there's always a connection. There's always a connection here. Connect the dots. <laughs> Connect the dots over here. Yeah. All right, as Connor says, we're all forgotten. Unfortunately, you're lucky if you're remembered. And now I have that song, Remember Me, from uh, that Disney movie. Which Disney movie was that thing? I don't know. Which no, one? Not, in, not in Kanto. What was the one where they, where they had the Deus Le Mortis? Coco. Coco. Yeah, I didn't see Coco. I'm sorry. Oh, it, it's a really good one. It, actually, seriously, it's really good. Yeah, Pixar. The, 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 I don't know if it's a Pixar one or not. I don't. I don't, granted, I don't keep track of Pixar that. Pixar is all owned Disney. by uh, Disney. It's all Disney in the end. I couldn't care less if, if Disney itself. Or, but yeah, it's really good. One of the songs is called "Remember Me." Hmm. It's actually you know the actor Benjamin Bratt. Maybe. Um, you would know him. I. You know, I'm going to give you a weird one where you might know him from. He was the cop in Miss Congeniality. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, yeah. 
that guy. He used to be in a lot of movies. Wait, uh, was it, wasn't he also in Demolition Man? He was in Demolition Man. He was also in... Um, See, that's how I know. There we go. No, that's all I had to say. He was also in Coco. And he knows yeah. how to use the three shells. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, he um, he actually was... the um, He played like a... I guess the best way to word it is like a Hispanic version of like Elvis and John Wayne thrown together kind of guy. Like singer, mm. movie star kind of guy. And he was... He died, and they're going. Wait, to, one of the big songs he had was "Remember Me," but anyway, it got stuck in my head. All right, anyways, I rant about random things. Tim says a lot of assistance from the Parcells era, I think. And you know what? You're not wrong. You're not wrong on that. And that's again, we're not including people who became Giants coaches. So that's even add that you get it more. You get Tom Coughlin in the mix then, because Tom Coughlin was wide receivers coach under Parcells. So, um, Connor says that's why we're the real America's team. Goddamn Skippy. Plus, we have more rings. We have more rings in the Cowboys, no matter what they say. NFL championships still count. <laughs> Connor says prefer Eastbound and Down. <laughs> now, are you talking Eastbound and Down the songs? I saw you put that a minute ago. When we we're talking about that. Or are you talking about Eastbound the the show, HBO show? That was a damn good show, by the way. Um. Connor also says, Coco, is that a stripper from the Go Go Club? Who says Go Go Club? What are <laughs> <laughs> the Go Go? That just sounds weird. It's like a 70s strip club there. Let's go to the Go Go. <laughs> I mean, there's a Go Go Rama off 35 and what's it? Lawrence Harbor? South Amboy or something like that. Yeah, South Amboy. Yeah, yeah, somewhere around there. I'm just, uh, listen, no offense to anybody living in South Amboy, but South Amboy is not exactly the place that says the, cl- the classy clubs. Is BYOB. <laughs> yeah, like I said. <laughs> not the place that I would say is the classy clubs. All righty, guys. Anyway, well, like I said, we'll be back Wednesday to talk about head coaches. We'll be back on Thursday to talk about assistant coaches who became head coaches elsewhere. And then, like I said, guys, of course, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, where you can go on my LinkedIn profile and you can watch us live there. Yes, um, you do. Of course, we're available afterwards all the time as well. All these all these are saved up here for you guys to watch whenever you want. YouTube's usually the best place to do that because I can cut out the intro and all. Um, again, uh, we're going to be uh, available on every single podcast platform, pretty much known demand. That usually goes up a couple hours after we're done recording here. Uh, and of course, if you ever like to sponsor the show, or if you just like what you're watching and want to say thank you, whoop, yes. We have, of course, buymeacupofcoffee.com slash two giant goofballs. Again, that's buymeacupofcoffee.com slash two giant goofballs. There you can also sign up for the membership there as well, which will give you extra perks as well. So extra access to us goofballs here as well. Um, and again, extra balls. I mean goofballs. Goof, all the goofballs, <laughs> as he puts Go Go Rama. <laughs> Connor says, the song, LOL, I do like that show Eastbound. Go, go, Rana, yeah. I'd be the old far there now if you went. I haven't watched that show in a while because I feel like he's quoting the show and I have, don't know it. I haven't watched it probably since it was like brand new. It was a damn good show, though, back in the day. Um, I didn't watch it. Connor also says, Roberto, why are you pointing at Drew's package area, LOL? <laughs> I was trying to see if you could see that he was manscaped. <laughs> Listen, they gave us free product. I'm just going to use it, okay? <laughs> yeah. All righty, guys. Like I said, we will see you guys again here Wednesday night. Appreciate everybody who's listening in, watching in, <laughs> however you're 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 getting involved. Definitely appreciate it. If you're one of the people also that are watching the show and don't comment, first off, that's fine. But comment along, say hi, because I know there's people out there. We can see how many people are in the show. We see you. We see you. <laughs> All right, guys. Appreciate it. again. We will see you guys Wednesday night. And as always, Giant fans, go Go G-Man! Go G-Man! G-Man! Thanks for listening to Two Giant Goofballs, a New York Giants podcast. We appreciate your support. If you made it this long, you must have enjoyed it. So I am sure you have followed us on all the social media platforms. Of course, you have subscribed to the show on your favorite app as well and given us a top rating. Right? Right? Right?